So welcome. In our previous lesson, as we went through First Corinthians, doing a survey on First Corinthians, at least I made a promise and mentioned that I was going to do another lesson and just focus on chapters 12, 13, and 14 of us Corinthians, especially as we look at spiritual gifts and tongues and things like that. And so we are going to spend some time today just in the Bible going word for word where possible, verse by verse where possible, and kind of just dig into uh, the context of us Corinthians as we study what uh, God communicated to the believers through Paul, the apostle, about gifts and tongues and things like that. So uh, please open your Bible, and I hope you have a notebook somewhere that you will be taking notes as we study and go along, all right? So let me just put this here for now. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to begin from there and just walk our way through. And I want you to see how it begins. Of course, remember Paul, if you remember uh, when we're doing the survey, Paul dealt with a lot of things in, in this letter, you know, in response to questions that he had been asked, in response to news that he had received about the different things that, were, that was happening in Corinth. Uh, you know, immorality, division, idolatry, marriage, and relationships, and uh, love, and you know, celebrating the Lord's Supper, and all of those things. He had spoken about it, and so the end of chapter 11 uh, deals with the Lord's Supper, what it is, and how it's supposed to be celebrated, and why it is supposed to be celebrated, right? And so if you're not sure of, of that, please uh, go to that lesson we had on when we're doing the survey of, you know, First Corinthians. Now, so in, in chapter 12, then this is how it begins. So look at what Paul says. So he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Now, I just want to pause there and mention something. Actually, in the original, in, in Greek, it doesn't have the word gifts. Uh, it just says concerning the spiritual. So I want to read for you the Greek passage just here in a bit. And then, of course, we'll talk about it as we get back to the passage. This is how it is in, in Greek, because it says in, in chapter 12, verse 1, Peri de ton neumatikon adelphoi o teleo omas agnoein. Right? And so he says, but concerning the spirituals, brothers, note I want you to be ignorant. Concerning the spirituals. And so literally that means what Paul is going to cover here is dealing with, you know, spiritual matters, whether that is connected to the Holy Spirit or the human spirit or the evil spirit is dealing with the spirituals. Now, concerning the spirituals, concerning the spiritual things, brothers, I, I don't want you to be uninformed. Some versions mentions it, ESV being one of them. Other versions says, I don't want you to be ignorant of it. You need to understand the spiritual things, human spirit, Holy Spirit, evil spirit, the spiritual things. So it says, concerning the spirituals, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Verse 2, look at what it says. It says, I know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Right. So and now Paul is reminding these guys of their background. and. And so the Co Corinth is one of those places just like Athens uh, that was full of idol and idolatry. And so idol worship and those practices were prevalent, right? And so Paul remind these guys, he says, now I want you to know, I want you to remember, so to speak, that you know that when you were pagans, you know this for a fact. It's not a rumor. It's not something that you've heard of. You know for a fact because this was your life before you met Jesus Christ, before the salvation you now share with one another in Christ happened. You know that you were an idol worshiper. You were led astray. And it's, look at what it says. It says to mute idols. Idols don't speak. Idols 
like you'd already say in chapter nine, you know, eight and nine about idols and food offered to idols. This is just things, right? Uh, you know, if, if it is a piece of tree, it is just tree it was just tree until you cut it and then carve an image out of it, right? They don't speak. So how do idols communicate and speak? Is it the, the stone or the wood and or the rock or the hill or the water, or whatever speaking? No, the, the demons that have taken possession of these stones and idols are speaking, right? But it says, you know for a fact that before Jesus Christ, you are an idol worshiper. And so you your mind was tuned a certain way. You were living in a certain direction. You lived your life. You think a certain way. You behave a certain way because that is what you were made to believe about God, about the spiritual things, right? And now just a just background, one of those things as, uh, that was connected to the idol worship. Now, the gods, idols, the gods had a specific way of communicating to the people. They had a specific language or term that they spoke to the people through. Now, so if I, for example, wanted to hear from the gods and wanted to talk to the gods. Of course, they had gods for everything. There's God of rain and God for protection and God for sunshine and God for fertility and God of good health and, you know, all of those. So whichever God I wanted to talk to. So I would go to the shrine where the gods is. But now I cannot speak to the gods that like I'm speaking right now. I cannot just use my language because that's not the way the gods communicated. So the gods communicated in one specific way. And so the priest of these temples, these idol temples, knew, supposedly knew the terms, the language that this god which of course, quote unquote, is idol, spoke in. And so the priest would teach you this language or this term, right? And, and you would have to get into, be high and get into some emotional experience and then do some babbling and repeat certain things and say what, what the priest was telling you. So the priest, the priest would teach you what to say and how to say and speak in the term or the language of the gods, and then the gods would hear you, all right? And so Paul says, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led, whatever they told you to do, you just did it. Whether it was do this or do that, you just did it because that was your life. Now he brings to verse three, therefore, I want you to understand. I want you to understand this. Now, you already know the pagan world and how the pagan world lives and what is done in the pagan world, what is done as far as idolatry is concerned, worshiping the idols and giving to the gods and sacrificing to the gods and whatever is done in the, you know, in idol worship. It says you already know that because that was your life before Christ. Now, I want you to know, therefore, that what? And I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the things that was happening in the church this time, you see, because of that experience, pagan uh, background, that led these people in their former life. Now that they're saved, they're in the church, but they're somehow borrowed. They're somehow copied and just brought and transferred the kind of experiences and the kind of things they used to do when they were still in idol worship. They have now brought it in the church. And so they're responding to God and trying to worship God and, you know, do the things of God, but in the ways of the pagan world. Now, for them to be saying this, that Jesus is accursed. Now, the mean part of their belief system and part of what they were incorporating in their worship was pre-Gnosticism. 
Now, from the Greek philosophers, Gnosticism is this belief that spirit is good and matter is evil. That, now, what is matter? Remember, uh, remember from your physics or science, even matter is anything that has weight and can occupy space, right? And so Gnosticism believed that matter, anything, so this human flesh, human body, which of course has weight and can occupy space, is evil. Right, the chair I'm sitting on is evil. The shirt I'm putting on is evil. The food I eat is evil. The bed is, you know, is the one that everything physical is evil. It's only the spiritual that is good, right? Now, unfortunately, as part of that, you know, that teaching was therefore denying the humanity of Jesus. And so that teaching was, so if Jesus is truly God, then he could not have had human body. Because the God with spirit is good, could not have come in the flesh, which is evil. It's so a good and evil could not have mixed, right? Therefore, one of these is possible. If Jesus is truly God, then he did not have a human body. But if Jesus truly had a human body, then he was not God, right? And, and, and so part of their teaching for, for some of these Greek philosophers and agnostics who believe, who somehow embrace the teachings of Jesus and about Jesus, who believed he existed, they were unfortunately teaching that Jesus Christ, right, at his death, the spirit, which is good, left. And the body, the human flesh, which is evil, died and perished on, and struggled. And so the human body, quote unquote, of Jesus was accursed because it's sinful and evil. And the spiritual part of him, which is good and, and, and holy, could not have mixed with the body of Jesus. And, and so Paul says, now I want you to understand that there's no one who is directly being led by the Holy Spirit of God, who is being used by the Holy Spirit of God, is going to say Jesus is accursed. He's going to say Jesus is sinful and deserving of death. So it's that can only come from a corrupted mind being led by a different spirit, not the Holy Spirit. That's why Abel says, now concerning the spiritual things. Right? So he says, I want you to understand that. Why? Because that was happening. Some of these people who were claiming to be led by the Holy Spirit and in their worship, speaking in, a, in unknown tongues, which are, whichever it was that we're going to see as we continue, they were getting to a point of saying Jesus is a curse. And Paul says, I want you to understand this. No one led by the Holy Spirit is going to say Jesus is a curse. The Holy Spirit leads people and points people to the, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not going to lead people away from him going to point people to glorifying and worshiping him not defaming his name and so paul is saying directly is saying now what you didn't know anyone was doing this was leaving this and believing this and preaching and teaching or saying this in their worship and prayer is not being led by the spirit of god they might be in the spirit but it's not the holy spirit leading them that's very important, guys. So yes, it's, it's possible you might be in the spirit. Someone might be speaking in the spirit or praying in the spirit and all of that. The question is like Paul even says in, in his remind, as he reminded his guys, is what spirit? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it just your human spirit that is puffed up? Or is it some evil spirit that has taken control of you? So he continues. Right. In verse four, now there are var varieties of gifts. You see, you know, bring gifts. All right. You see this plural. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Capital. Hagios Noma. Hagios Numa. Pardon me. The Holy Spirit. Not the human spirit, not the cacos, not the evil or the bad spirit. It is the Holy Spirit, the Hagios, the Holy One. And 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 in 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 your English Bible or even in the local one, it should be with a capital letter S, 
spirit versus small letter, which is either human spirit or evil spirit, right? So it says, now there are different gifts, there are varieties of gifts, and it's going to talk about those different gifts in a bit. But it says, now all of these different gifts is sourced in one. It is the Holy Spirit with the source of all of these gifts. And you notice already, before you even get to defining and talking about these different gifts, where it is called spiritual gift for a reason. It says they're all gifts, but given by the Holy Spirit. Now, if it is a gift, one, we don't demand for a gift. We don't decide on what kind of gift we're going to get. We don't decide when and how we're going to get it. And we don't definitely decide on who's going to get another gift and which gift that we're going to get, especially if we are the receiver. A gift is something, one, you don't deserve, two, you don't expect, and three, it's solely given, dependent on the giver. The giver decides on what gift, on how and when and to whom. I right? just wanted to say that because today we have so many people who are crying and pleading with God and doing this and doing that, asking God for a gift. And I want the other spiritual gift. I want the gift of healing or I want the gift of miracles. I want the gift of this. And God, please give it to me. And somehow we've been made to believe in a twisted way that if we give certain things, if we sow a seed, or if we fast enough, or do this enough, God will have no choice but to give us what we're asking of him. And that is not true, and that is not how God works. One, if you're teaching that, then you don't know God. Or you're talking about a different God, not Yahweh. And if you've been made to believe that, and that's what you're doing, you're, you're trying to impress God by giving enough money and sowing, sowing enough seed of faith, quote in quote, and going on, you know, doing enough fasting and all that, because you think by doing those things, God will get be cornered into a position where it feels like, you know what, I have no choice but to give this person what they're asking. Otherwise, I don't have faith. That's not how it works. Gift. Just like salvation, we don't deserve it. It's a gift. It's a gift of God. So none of us can stand and boldly say, you know what? I had to work so hard and give so much and do ABCD for me to get the salvation. No, we did not do anything about it. We don't even deserve it. But he gave it to us. Why? It's a gift. Right, so he continues. And there are varieties of service but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So you notice it just brings the Trinity right here. The Holy Spirit, the, the Son, Jesus Christ, who is Lord, and the Father, God who is the Father. Right? It says, now, all of the spiritual gift, all the gift we have is given to us through the Holy Spirit. And all of this Gift is given for the service of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ. And all of this is empowered by God with the Father. All right? He continues in verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Hagios, Numa, Holy Spirit. Again, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. To each is given the manifestation to each believer. To each believer is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Why is it given? Why are believers given gifts? Whether it is of healing or teaching or preaching or service, serving others uh, and taking care, you know, through meeting needs and things like that, whatever it is, why are believers given? Why are these manifestations given? Look at what it says. For the common good. The end of verse 7. For the common good. So, God gave you the spiritual gift, whichever it is that is given to you, not for your sake, not for your glory, not so that you can boast about, not so that people can know you, not so that people can praise you, not so that you become, be lifted in a pedestal level somewhere. 
but so that one, as you use that gift, when God is glorified and his body is built for the good of the other members in the body. Just like the eye of a human person exists, not for its own benefit, but for the benefit of the body. The ear exists not for its own benefit, but for the benefit of the body. So that as the ear plays its role in hearing and the eyes plays its role in seeing, the body is built. It is for the good of the body. Because when the eyes are seen well, then the body, the feet can walk and lead the person where it's supposed to go without any problem, without stumbling and falling, without getting into a ditch, without knocking, hitting yourself in a tree or a wall. So it's, these manifestations are given for the common good. But you see the unfortunate bit is that we, it's becoming more and more common that the people who have some kind of gifts have turned those gifts for their benefit. It's for themselves and, and use it as a reason to be prideful and point people to themselves and their achievements and what they do, what they can do, and what others are not able to do because they don't have that gift. And primarily, that's why people are crying day and night and going on to fasting and trying to sow seed of faith into the, this man of God or that woman of God or whoever they are because they they kind of want to have that kind of gift as well because now we've made it about us and the ones who have the gift and not on God. You see, the saddest thing that is happening today is what was happening at that time, that the people started putting more value on the manifestations, on the experiences, and not on the message and on the purpose. That is why some of these people are getting to the point in that claim of being led by the Spirit and speaking in the Spirit and in their worship and speaking in tongues that they were actually saying Jesus is a curse. They were abusing and degrading and defaming and ashaming the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And the people didn't care because they were not listening to the message. They were not using it for the common good. It was now about, oh, wow, the guy can speak. He can pray. She can do this. Wow, I have not heard that language before. He's, you know, that's, an, they're really, act there and we're not paying attention to the message and the purpose that's why Paul said I want you to know that if the person is led by the Holy Spirit they're going to proclaim the Lordship of Jesus Christ and they're going to live for his glory not otherwise right because he continues and so he says for to one, verse 8 is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom, and to another, the utterance of the knowledge, according to the same spirit, to another, faith by the same spirit, to another, gifts of killing by the same spirit, by the one spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. You know this now, this distinguishing between spirits here is small letters, spirits, plural, the versus spirit. Small, singular, capital letter, agios, spirit, pneuma, agios, pneuma, the Holy Spirit, one, capital, singular, compared to spirit, small letters, but plural, distinguishing between spirits, human spirit, and evil spirit. All right, but then it continues to another. Various kinds of tongues. You notice that tongues, plural. All right. Now, something that Paul is going to do here as we continue to help these people understand the difference between the gift of tongues, plural, that comes from the Holy Spirit and a tongue that was used in the pagan idol worship is going to give a contrast. And I don't want you to miss this. All right, but here we want to just want to set it straight here that we are told that the Holy Spirit is given to some. Now you notice it says to some to another gift of tongues. So you notice one we're told it's a gift, and we're being told not everyone is given the same kind of gift. It says 
to some, to one is given through the Holy Spirit utterance of wisdom, to another knowledge, to another faith, to another healing, to another the working of miracle, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another parish kinds of tongues. So, so you notice that someone that those who have been given the gifting, the gift of healing, and they don't have the one of tongues, they're, they're the other's tongues, and they don't have the one of preaching. You notice what he's saying. The sort of one, this in God's plan and His will. Not every believer is supposed to get the same spiritual gift. But what have we done today? We've made it clear and kind of pushing that one, especially just like the believers and these guys in Corinth were doing, they had prized the gifting of tongues to be the best and the most important of all to the point that the ones who did not have it, or if you did not have it, somehow the implication was you are either you're not saved or you don't have the Holy Spirit. You don't have, you, you, you're not able to. And so that's why that abandoned the ministry of the word, which is what you say is prophecy, to speak for God's word, and, and service and encouragement and all of that. That's why there was division in the church. There was fight and chaos and quarrels and, you know, immorality and idolatry and all of those things. Why? Because they made, of all the different gifting that God has given, which all is supposed to be used for the building up of the body of Christ, everything else was neglected except for tongues. And, and that's why there was now a forging for the ones who probably did. Now there was infusion and a borrowing from the pagan world, what used to do, what they used to do as far as tongues and all that was concerned, they now brought it in. And that is what Paul is going to mention when we get to chapter 13, says, now let me show you a more noble way. You people think that gift of tongues and speaking in tongues is the most important one of all. Let me show you the most important of all is love, because we're going to cover that when we get there, when we get to chapter 13. All right, so all these, look at what it says in verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. All of these gifts, of course, not all of them are mentioned here. Some of them we're going to find in chapter 14, mention some of them. But if you go to Romans, it mentions some of them there as well. But it says all the spiritual gifts all the gifts that believers have. He says it is given by the Holy Spirit when he's the one who apportions, so to speak. He's the one who distributes and gives to each individual members. He says, Jacob is going to get this. I'm giving this to Jacob. I'm giving this to Peter. I'm giving this to Deacons. I'm giving this to Beth. I'm giving this to James. I'm giving this to Daniel. I'm giving this to, you know, Brian. I'm giving that to... Jerry, all of those, he says, he apportions according to his will. You notice, know as he wills, not according to your will, not according to my will, not according to the will of according for the man of God, not according to the will of the woman of God, no bishop or a pastor or even apostle or even the pope can make God do something that is not his will. There's nothing on earth or even under the earth or even in heaven that we as human beings can do to make God do something that is outside and contrary to his will. He is sovereign and in church and it does things according to his will. And we need to know that. So as we approach the spiritual gifts, as we talk about the spiritual gifts, as we talk about being in Christ and how we relate to that, we need to understand that it is according to his will, not ours. That's why Jesus even said in his prayer to the Father, says, no, not, your, not my will, but yours be done. That's why he said now, there's something very important that oftentimes we've kind of missed when, when you read the gospel and we're so much you know, so many times use that scripture out of context where Jesus says, ask anything in my name, it'll be given to you. 
You know, we, we can't just quote that, ask anything in my name. So you see, he says, ask anything. So me, I'm asking him to give me the gifts of healing. I want to be a miracle walker. You know, I want him to give me the, you know, the gift of prophecy. I want to be able to prophesy and, and look into the future. Now, what we forget from that passage, what many people, do, you know, don't do and do is one. What they do is they just go to that portion, ask anything in my name. And it will be given to you. That's what they do. But what they don't do is reading that passage in its context. Because before they ask anything in my name, and it will be given to you, ask the Father anything in my name, it will be done to you. This is what it says. Submit yourself to the Lord. Obey me. Abide in me and I in you. And whatever you ask, it will be given to you. Abide in me and I in you. If we're abiding in him and he is in us, then that means, one, we've, we're starting, we're learning, we're growing, we know already that everything is done according to his will and not ours and not mine. That means because we are abiding in him and he in us, whatever we are asking is not contrary to his will, is not contrary to his plan, is not contrary to his word that has been revealed to us that we are starting and growing and abiding in. And so why is it that whatever we ask in his name is going to be given to us? Because whatever we've asked is already according to his will in his plan because it is not contradicting his plan and will and what he's revealed in his word, that part defines what happens in the second part. Abide in me and I in you. Defined the ask anything. The anything that we're going to be asking if we are abiding in him and he in us is already according to his will. That is why the father will do it. All right, just wanted to mention that. You mentioned that as we talk about God's will. Right, he continues with his illustration. So we get to verse 12 here. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. He now brings a human body for his illustration. He brings an analogy. For example, human body. So this is just, this is me, Jacob, but I have many members. The eyes, the nose, and the mouth, and the ear, and the chin, and the head, the brain, the things you don't see, my hands, and, you know, the palm, and the fingers, each of these has a role, you know, they play my, my leg, and my feet, and, and the heart, and, the, you know, all of those members, you know, the different individual members that we are counting, but all of them forms and, forms and make me to be Jacob. And say, so the body of Christ is like that. This is one body, but there are many members. And when it comes to gifting, he's given each, each of these members different gifts and ability, different from each other. And the goal is that as each of these members plays their role, the body is, is built and nurtured. Just like we have in a human body. You see, the role the eyes play is not the same role that the ears play. The role the ears plays is not the same role that the nose plays. The role the nose plays is not the same role that the mouth plays. And the role the mouth plays is not the same the one the tongue does. And so it is with the rest of the members or parts of the body. But each of these members must be functional. Each of these roles must be taking place. The eyes must be operating, must be using its gifting. The ears the same, the mouth, the, the nose, and you know, the legs and the feet and the arms and the heart and the liver and the pancreas and you know the all of those members must be playing their role so that the body is okay. And he says as you just spoken about spiritual gift says there's no gift that the Holy Spirit has given that is useless. Every gift is important and must be used. So we should never prize one gift above the other. We should never prioritize one gift above the other. If the Holy Spirit gave it, he gave it for a reason and it must be used for the building of the body. Of Christ. That's what he says.
For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. For in one spirit, which spirit? In the Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, which body? The body of Christ. We're now in Christ. Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of this one spirit. The Jews who believed in Jesus Christ, which we saw this when we were studying the book of Romans, the Jews who believed in Jesus Christ are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Just like Greeks or Gentiles who believed in Jesus Christ, they're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Those who were free uh, and are believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Those who are slaves or servants are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who indwells their masters. Male and female, the same. And so, so there's no one who has a reason one to boast, to try and, and think themselves better than others. Because if they're in Christ, then they don't have anything more than what you have in Christ. Because in Christ, one, they were saved by God's grace, just like you are saved by God's grace. The gift they have, was given to them as a gift by the Holy Spirit, just like you. They're indwelt actually by the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who indwells you. They have the hope of eternal life that God has promised in Christ, just like you do. And when time comes, either for us to die or for the Lord to return if we're still alive, we will all meet him and be with him and spend eternity in his presence forever, all of us, rich or poor, healthy or, or not, male or female, black or white, Jew or Gentile, it'll all be because of Jesus Christ. They say, no one is better than the other. It comes to salvation. For the body, verse 14, does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, now he's explaining, he's now to make his point clear, I've already explained this, I'm just going to read it now. So it says in verse 15, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, what would not, that would not make it less as part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of, the, of that body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing come from? Where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor, again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, are very important, and you cannot get rid of them. You cannot do without them. That's what he's saying. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable were well, bestowed the greater honor and our, our unpresentable part are treated with greater modesty, which a more presentable body or parts do not require. But God has so compose the body, giving great honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoices together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues, plural, uh, all opposed now to, to prove his point that there are many members, but also to make emphasis on the fact that not everyone has been called to doing the same thing, and not everyone has been given the same gift, but different individuals have different gifts, different from the ones their friends and colleagues and other members in the body has. Look at the questions he asks here. Verse 29, 
are all apostles? No. For example, just right after Jesus has ascended, in Acts chapter 1, and getting into chapter 2, we are told at least there were 120 believers in total who were gathered in the upper room. But only 11 of them were apostles before Matthias was brought in to replace Judas. And then, of course, after that, we see, we see Paul coming into the picture as well. So he asked, are all apostles? No. Look at what he asked again. Uh, all prophets? No. So why do everyone want to be apostles today? And why do everyone want to be prophets today? All right. Uh, all teachers? And again, the answer to that is no. Do all work miracles? No. Do all possess gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? Plural. No. Do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire higher gifts. Earnestly desire higher gift. Now then he's going to get into showing us this higher gift. What is this higher gift that he's talking about? If, and then he says, I will show you still a more excellent way. The answer to all the other questions are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all miracle workers, are all, he says, no, no. He says, desire, earnestly desire the higher gift. Now, what is that higher gift that all of us should desire? Is it to speak in tongues? No. Is it to perform miracles? No. Is it to be the greatest teacher of all? No. There's something that he says, this higher gift is something that God desires everyone to have. So he says, now I'll show you a more excellent way. That gift, the one all of us should desire, the one that he says, the one he says is high. It is love. It is love. That's what he's saying. It is love. So, in our next time together, we're going to just cover this section, this chapter 13. And talk about love. But of course, in connection to what is already said in chapter 12, we'll cover this chapter 13 of love. And then we cover chapter 14 and, and look at what it says about prophecy and, and gift of tongues in detail. And of course, we will keep bouncing back and forth between these two chapters. As we, by the time we go to chapter 14, we're going to be running and making reference to chapter 12 and chapter 13 and, and go to 14 and, and come back, back and forth like that. And our goal is, my goal is to help you grow from this and study and learn and, and have a clear understanding of what God has said about gifts and tongues and prophecies and things like that. But for now, we're going to stop here and then we'll, we'll cover in, in another lesson altogether. God bless you.